And through that relationship building of the account executives and that employee, we'll pick up on things. But more often than not, that becomes that leap of faith. Just go. Just go because it's not that long of a time frame. So welcome to another episode of Relocation Leader. I'm Zach Turbis, your host. Today we have Molly Ivancic with me, a Senior Vice President of International Services at NEI Global Relocation. And Molly, you have a lot on your table. <laughs> I do. And it's great to be here today, Zach. I'm looking forward to our discussion and talking a little bit more about assignments and you know what our clients might be experiencing, all the questions they might have that come up and you know, let's get going. Can you tell me just a little bit and for our audience, kind of the breadth of your responsibilities and what they encompass here at NEI? Absolutely. So I oversee our international services team, and this includes what we call our America's office, our EMEA office, and our, our Singapore, our APAC office. So the entire teams in these areas, um, in addition to our compensation and cost estimate services team as well. So we really have the pleasure of working with clients that are all over the world. And any given day, we touch every single part of the globe, which is Oh, for me, absolutely wonderful because that's my background. I have a, a game that I kind of want to get us into, <laughs> but before we get to okay. that, you know, tell me how you do what you do without having like super knowledge because it's pretty incredible, you know, everything that you're responsible for. Um, how do you uh, manage uh, that that team? You know, the all the different interactions that you're you have to accomplish on a daily basis? Well, I think that comes a lot from just my personal background is where it started. Um, I have been an expat. I've lived overseas for many years. International is what I've always done. I kind of make the joke like domestic is foreign to me because my whole professional experience has been in the world of international. And what that means is every day when you're working with the different cultures, you jump in, you understand it is different. It can be different. How do we communicate differently? Business practices can vary as well. So that's how one part of how I can do it every day. Um, and then just that incredible curiosity of working with different cultures and people around the world. It's exciting. It's great. I don't know of many other places that you can do that. And then we get to work with people who are moving their lives across the globe. It's a very important time. I know how stressful it can be. So just working with them and then having that next level team to work with them and support them uh, again, just a fantastic experience for us. And then relying on that team who has the same passion I do for delivering the service, for working with different cultures. That's how we do it every single day. And I think most days with a smile on our face, too. <laughs> most days. Most days. Um, so I'm curious, uh, what are some things that have surprised you since being in this role? I think every day there's probably a little surprise on something because on the international side, it changes all the time. Uh, one of the most challenging times we had, of course, was during the pandemic. I don't think anyone predicted uh, the challenges that would come forth. Borders closed instantly. People were trying to get on planes. They couldn't get home. Um, there was very emotional times for everyone. Uh, it's scary. I think people who felt like I'm away from home, I want to get home. So, you know, those changes that came up, but that has helped build resilience, perseverance over the past years and just kind of rolling with it because that next crisis, so to speak, globally is always around the corner. We're prepared. We know how to do it. You just put on that crisis hat and you get going. It's also, um, I think, added to people's tool belts, you know, with, reg with regards to like, you know, uh, not just handling issues, but just improving processes and it kind of rethinking business in general. Absolutely, Zach. It's the critical thinking. We talk about that so much. It's critical thinking. If A, then B, then C, what can happen next? And think five steps ahead because those five steps, they will come. Are you ready for them? Or are you going to be caught off guard for it? And that, again, that's just that preparation that we try to do and train the teams to be aware of every day in an international. You might might or might not know, but then you've got to start asking the questions. So are you ready for my quote game? Okay. Yes. <laughs> You're like as ready as I can be. Uh, so she's not seeing these quotes. Um, but the, the game is that I'm going to give you a quote. Okay. And then I really want you to sort of in your head, uh, tell me whether it applies more to leadership or more to relocation because we're a relocation leader. Get it? 
Get it. <laughs> but um, so anyway, I'm going to give you this quote. You're going to tell me which one it applies to, but then you have to tell me why. Okay. Okay. I almost feel like I need to write this down here a little bit. It's okay. We'll just quotes? wing it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So the first one's from Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. and it says, any fool can know. The point is un is to understand. So any fool can know. The point is to understand. Does it apply to leaders or more, more? more to leader? Because you can probably take any one of these quotes and and yeah. apply it either way. Mm -hmm. But in your mind, does it apply more to just like leadership, or is there a greater uh, relocation application? Completely in my world, it's relocation. You have to understand what's happening because you could get an email in, you could have a call. The understanding part, the reading between the lines, what else is going on here, what's said, what's not said, it's all about understanding. And one thing is I coach the teams globally. It's like, well, they said that, but is that really what they mean? Do you really understand what they're asking for? And if the answer is I'm not sure, then we need to go back and ask again, ask differently, get it, get it understood what we need to do. You know, when I when I read this quote initially, it reminded me of, of another quote, you know, where it's like, you know, the good Lord gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> yep. So, all right, on to the next quote. OK, so this is from Roy T. Bennett. It says, it's only after you've stepped outside your comfort zone that you begin to change, grow and, and transform. Yeah, definitely my world every day in relocation. It can't be an international. The minute you get off that plane, you go somewhere, you're out of your comfort zone. Unless you grew up there by chance or frequented it as a when you were growing up, the language is different. The smells are different. The food is different. If someone tells me that's not out of their comfort zone initially, then I think that's exceptional because for most people, it certainly is. And then pick up your whole life and go and then reset your life there in that new location. So how do you, it's a piggyback on that. How do people change, grow, and transform after going on these um, excursions? I think it's hard. Um, I think for most people, it is hard. They go through a lot of different phases. There's the excitement. My goodness, it's going to be wonderful. We're going to see the world. We're going to do all of these things. And then that feeling wears off. Trust me, it wears off. And the everyday sets in of the reality of I might not understand. Why do they do it like this here? The day-to-day -day, going to the stores is very different than perhaps um, you don't have your favorite foods anymore. Your friend group is gone. You don't see your family like you used to see them or you're only getting home now once a year. Um, it, it becomes so challenging to adapt and you have to fight through the negatives, those negative feelings. All, you know, you come home after the day and like, I just miss home. You know, the tears might come. They will come likely. Um, and then you have other family members who maybe don't adapt well. The kids, maybe they're not getting on well in school. It, it's a, it's a life-changing event. No question about it. But I think if someone can get through it, if that employee, that family, those children can get through that initial months, year or so, um, I think most people will say it's probably the most amazing thing that they've ever done in their life. Yeah. One of the most amazing. Yeah. Are there really yeah. amazing things? But it's a it's a life altering event. And it, it often puts people on different trajectories as well. And yeah. what they want to do, experience and grow. So and, and not to get too far away from the game, because I love the game. But, um, you know, when they're experiencing so many negatives, uh, what kind of support do we have for them so that they can get through those and succeed there? Yeah, there's a lot of really depending on the client and the type of benefits that they would offer. Um, it, it seems very basic, but language training is a great start because once you start to understand some of the language of where you are living, uh, language, that's how you bring people together. If you don't understand what people are saying and what they're doing, language is that precursor into culture. Um, so if you understand a little bit of the language, then you start looking at the culture. So the cultural training, the support, um, that that's what I can say right off the bat, helps people get started. And then being very open-minded, getting out and exploring things. Oftentimes there are different uh, communities, expat communities. When you're working in, with other expats, uh, going out on excursions with them, they know how it feels. And those can be lifelong friendships that are built as well. So that that's tools and options that are out there, but it takes effort. It takes effort to go out and socialize and work on building those relationships. Nice. So I have two more quotes. Okay. okay. Um, this next one is uh, from Kurt Vonnegut. Um, and it says, we are what we pretend to be. So we must be careful about what we pretend to be. I 
I'm going to put that on the leadership leadership side. Okay, how so? How so? Um, so if I think we're not coming across genuine as leaders in an organization anywhere, even in our lives, um, then I think you can lose your way pretty quickly. And people do pick up when you're not genuine. And if you're pretending or not comfortable in your own skin, as we say, it takes time to figure out too. It's part of growing up, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So nice. All right, last one. One of my favorite people here. Uh, Winston Churchill says the price of greatness is responsibility. Mm. I think that can go on both sides. Obviously, as a leader, obviously, as a leader, you are responsible for many things um, for your team members, for the organization, the business goals. Um, but on the relocation side, it does fall to us to make sure that experience is as positive it can, as it can be for that employee, because, again, they are picking up their life and moving them to a different country. That's a huge responsibility. Huge. We don't take it lightly. No one on our team takes it lightly. Things can and do go wrong. How quickly we can fix them, that makes all the difference in the world. Um, I would like to say everything goes perfect, you know, 99% of the time, if I can say but no. We live, <laughs> we live in the real world. Yeah. And those little hiccups come along the way. Sometimes it's bigger than a hiccup. And it's just really preparing that employee that we're there to help them through that. And if this happens, call me. This is how we're going to work through it. So it is a huge responsibility. And the quotes that I have seen over the years, the feedback that I have seen over the years, pictures I have seen over the years from those employees and families that we've supported. Um, it's it's so rewarding, so amazing um, to know how much we can impact our, their lives. Have you seen Rocky Balboa? Like not the... Which part? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's like 25 of them. But, um, you know, the the one that's just titled Rocky Balboa, where his son has grown up and whatever. No, I have not seen that one. Okay. okay so, but... all right, I'm going to okay. nerd out a little bit here. Okay. Um, but there's a scene where he's uh, in a disagreement with his son. Mm -hmm. You know, he thinks his son should be, um, you know, pushing through in, in life a little bit, you know. And he, he says... Um, you know, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's something to the, to the effect of, you know, it's, it's not about how many times you get knocked down. It's about how many times you get back mm -hmm. up. Right. Which like is all Rocky, you know, like that he made movies about how many times that guy got the snot kicked out of him <laughs> and then got back up, you know, and won the um, match. You know, even in the, the Rocky videos where he doesn't win, they still made a whole movie about where he like lost in the end, mm -hmm. but it was, it was his spirit, yep. you know, that everyone admired. And I, I think of that and I'm like, everyone resonates with that. And yet somehow when we get to business, we just kind of forget that that's the mentality that should be the mentality. You know, we have to pretend we pretend like everything's perfect and everything should go perfectly, but that's not how the real world, world works. And it, we really do rely on people to have that same spirit, that like Rocky spirit, you know? And, um, that's why, you know, like any, I, uh, in the most recent triple survey, we got number one in service recovery, yeah. you know, and that, that is that spirit, yep. you know? And so it's just, it just kind of boggles my mind a little bit how it's like, don't forget that in business, like things go wrong. You need to be with people who know how to uh, act when things go wrong. Well, and I think that's the past three, four years. That's what that has taught us. Definitely. And knowing there are things outside of anyone's control sitting here in the room when you're on your calls, we all knew we couldn't control the congestion at the ports, the uh, borders closing outside of our control. What we could do is just try to manage the situation. What's next? What can we solve for? And that's become a bit of the new norm. And then when we have our clients who some could be fabulous partners in understanding that because they're seeing this um, within their own walls, so to speak, of we never had this before. Nope, because this is unprecedented for most people who are working now, who who went through these past years. Um, how do we get through it together? Because, yeah, the perfection part, uh, that's the real life. It's you know, how do we how do we <laughs> how do we work through it together? Yeah. You know, being proactive, critically thinking, moving down the steps and still keeping that that vision there of the, the excellent service, you know, that's our, that's our goal. And when we don't meet it, we know that it's it, uh, not what we want to have, but I think you can still have excellent service recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, we can still find ways to reach that excellency, even if in, initially it wasn't that outcome that we wanted. Yep. Absolutely. So now for the fun questions. Okay. okay. Um, so getting into the discussion, uh, walk me through, my maybe hypothetical, maybe not so hypothetical, <laughs> short-term assignment to Geneva 
Um, what? Let's see. When's the best part? The best time of the year to be in Geneva? I don't know. For those in Geneva, they'd probably say the whole year except January and February because it's a little gray and cold. All but right. if you like skiing, you probably want to go because, you know, then there's okay. the well, snow in the mountains. I'll so. take the spring. So the that, spring, that, okay. That's when I plan to tell Randy I'm going overseas. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell me, kind of like walk me through, like as a transferee, mm -hmm. you know, what should I be concerned with? Yeah. So first thing I'd talk professionally. So if you're company, we're saying, okay, Zach, you need to go to Geneva. I'd be asking myself, why am I being sent, especially on a short term assignment, because those short term assignments traditionally are meant for knowledge transfer. So you have some specific skills, knowledge that you need to be there to help train the individuals locally for that. Or we're going to say that great opportunity, we see you as an up and coming leader globally in our organization. We want to put you there for a bit, get your feet wet for a period of time and learn that area of the business there in Geneva. So that's professionally, uh, especially short term assignments where that focus tends so to lie. So this is the mission. This is the mission. What are we going to do professionally? Now, short term assignments, um, you're going to go by yourself typically. You got to leave everybody behind. Just keep that in mind. Um, so then I'm going to say, OK, you go by yourself. Do you speak French? Uh, no. No. Okay. So language, but Geneva is a pretty international city. So you're probably going to be okay to get around speaking English, but do you want to integrate? So do we need to look at how are you going to do personally? Have you ever traveled Europe much? Not yet. Yep. yep. Um, so being a still a quote Western um, country, still very different from the United States. I have seen a lot of European films. Too, and I'm so. sure they look great because everybody yep. loves going on vacation to Europe. <laughs> But if we're going to send you for a short term assignment, I'm going to say we're going to send you for a year. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to be challenging. It's going to be very different. You're going to understand um, locally that people aren't necessarily as friendly as they are here. Um, the store hours, that day to day living, especially if you're on your own, when you're used to maybe having more support home here at home, um, it's going to get harder. You're going to have to find ways to adapt. Um, the housing, finding housing, well, it's probably going to be smaller than what you're used to be living in here. The furnishings are going to be different. Oh, goodness. Well, streaming is a thing now, so you could probably get a lot of your <laughs> programs now in English. But, you know, before all of that, you know, you're just your comforts of your favorite television shows or which you could go that you don't have that anymore. And even with um, streaming services, and such, there's still blocks on what you can access in different countries as well. What would be big for me is like, you know, family back home. Like, how do you just leave your family like that? Well, you know? and, yeah, and that's, and that's the other piece. You know, will you go back home every few months to visit them? Will your work even allow that? If you're busy, depending on what that mission is and those mm -hmm. objectives, do you even have time to basically spend a day traveling to get home, to stay a few days, to turn around and get back? Mm -hmm. Or uh, will your family come visit you? Do they have time? They're busy with their lives. Um, you know, if you have small children, that's always a bit of an adjustment to be going those distances. I mean, you've got just the practicalities of jet lag to figure out when you're trying to go back and forth. And uh, so those are what would be like maybe swirling around in my head. You know, maybe we're already having those conversations, you know, um, but then I developed some hesitancy, you know, yep. and I'm like, uh, you know, I'm. This is that's a long time. And, um, you know, what what is being provided to help some of, ease some of those hesitancies? You can't you can't handle all of them. But, you know, what what does the company do to kind of get me to? Yes, there. Well, on a short term assignment, um, I think that's going to be more the focus on per, the professional, because a lot of times they say it's only 12 months. Uh, it's only 12 months. If it'd be three years, then we say, well. On that, well, there's different organizations we can connect to our destination services provider. Um, you're looking at the housing, the schooling. What would that be for your family if they would choose to go? But that short term, that kind of jump jump off into that deep end. You know, we could maybe connect you to one of the providers if you have specific questions about what it is to live there. But more often than not, that becomes that leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Just go. Okay. Just go because it's not that long of, of a yeah. time frame, really. So I'm curious, uh, from the mobility manager's perspective, though, um, like, what are they thinking about? So on the other side of things, you know? Yep. I think, again, do we have the right individual for what this mission is? And hopefully they've talked about that with those business leaders, those business managers who put the request in and say, we need this person to go. 
okay, is this fully vetted? Why? And then the cost. Are we aware how much it's going to cost? Switzerland is a high cost country. They should be paying for the housing the entire time. Um, utilities, uh, cost of living difference or any type of per diem. So it's up, up front. It's really important to understand what's the cost impact here. Mm -hmm. Because if we're looking mm -hmm. at that professional mission and those goals, are we going to be able to start calculating that return on investment? It's a hard calculation to get to. But what we wouldn't want to have happen, we send you for a year. It costs the company X dollars. You come back after that and say, this is just really not it for me. And you leave mm -hmm. the organization because that cost is gone. You took mm -hmm. that experience and that value with you to someone else. Yep. Yeah. So we've covered the transferees, you know, concerns, mm -hmm. you know, the global, the mobility managers, um, what they're thinking about. How does the RMC come alongside um, both of them and facilitate a successful move? Yeah. So really from that mobility manager side. So on the client side, if they've gotten any information about the employee, maybe this hesitancy, they know they've heard that from the business manager. It can be more successful if we know that up front, because our account executives can then kind of help coach the conversation, help dig in a little bit and answer those questions that maybe haven't really been spoken outside the family. And we can start answering them or get that information to that employee to help make that decision. So that's, but we know that doesn't always happen. So if we don't have that level of detail, our account executives are still going to go through assessments, starting the relationship, because I think it's very important. We say we have a relationship with that relocating employee. We are going to be working with them throughout the process. It's not like we start and then leave them and say, good luck. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, you know, see you when you come back. That, that's not what happens. And through that relationship building of the account executives and that employee, we'll pick up on things. Because that employee will start to say, gosh, I'm really not sure. I, I think I'm just really going to miss home. Mm -hmm. And if it gets to a degree that we know is outside of the regular, I'm a little bit nervous about going, then we're going to flag some things to the client and say, just we're picking up on some things. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of this? We just wanted to make sure you were aware. And that's all within that confidentiality that we have to maintain with that employee. Mm -hmm. But then we also have responsibility, obviously, to our clients to share if we think there are red flags out there that they need to be aware of mm -hmm. so they can look at on their side. Yeah. So that they can make the appropriate assessment. Absolutely. It's not a, a failed attempt, you know. Right. Um, and then or so that you can make those adjustments so that they feel comfortable. Right. Absolutely. All right. So switching gears, though. So um, did you know about my long term self-initiated um, <laughs> assignment to Singapore next year. I hadn't heard about that one either. So you're I don't think Randy has heard she either. either. <laughs> okay. But um, we're going to go with it. Okay. Good. So um, go in January because Singapore is warm. Okay. okay. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, so, what are some things uh, that I need to start thinking about uh, for this long term um, assignment? How does it differ than, you know, when I'm going to Geneva? Well, Singapore is completely different. Completely different from the setup, the city size, the dense population. Um, you're in an Asian culture. So culturally, you've got a lot happening. And Singapore is also a huge melting pot of all sorts of different cultures, very cosmopolitan, um, a global city. So um, I would say coming from the U.S. here, where we have a lot more space, you have everything around you. You have cars, you're driving and moving to Geneva where you're going to move a little bit more into public transportation, but you still have more nature around you. It's more surrounding. And then you're going to go right into Singapore, which is pure cityscape, mm -hmm. right? Wonderful high rises if you're into that luxury, um, but a very different lifestyle. You're taking the mass transit, you're taking the MRTs. You are really moving to the big city life. Um, and I think... From a personal side, are you have you lived in the big city life before where you know it's a constant hustle bustle, everything's going on? So I think for some people who are not used to that and did not or lived in that, that can become very exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the piece. You have your work that you do during the day for the company, but then you still have to go home at one point and live. How does the preparation differ, you know, between preparing somebody for that short term assignment where they're not taking her the family, yeah. you know, and then now shifting gears and say, OK, now we're going to take the whole family. So ideally um, you do a pre-move trip or call a pre-visit trip. So that's really that first step. 
say, are you've never been there or maybe you've only visited the family's coming. It's a pre-visit trip. So you get to go see with your own eyes, have your spouse with you. Say, is this something that we think we can do for three years? And we have a provider on the ground that we connect you with and they can show you around. They will show you representative housing. So what the apartments would look like that you might live in, what it is to get around different shopping districts and potentially even schools that you might be considering sending your children to and the different types of schools. And that trip is so important on that long-term assignment if you're not familiar with that area, um, because of course, long-term assignments are very costly. That, and we've seen it happen. That pre-move trip, they've come back, the spouse usually said, no, we just can't do it. Something has come up. Or even if there's a, you know, a child that has special needs, medical conditions, and they can't get that same level of care in that location, um, that, that's a deal breaker mm -hmm. then. So it might be you're going on a, on a company assignment to Singapore then, and they stay behind. But that's really that tool up front that we certainly recommend is to do a pre-visit trip to make sure this does feel like a place that you can go. So the, the planning portion, what about the execution portion, portion of that um, assignment where mm -hmm. now they're, um, you know, boots on the ground, they're in the country yep. and uh, they're officially expats. Um, how does the, the care doesn't just stop, you know, once they get there, right? No, no. So we have two sides from the, when you get there, you get settled in, you've secured your housing and signed the leases, everything's running um, as normal, then we still have, uh, you know, minimum quarterly check-in times with you um, to make sure everything's okay. And of course, the offer is always there. If you need anything, anything comes up, we're here. We're here to support you with that. Um, the same thing would go for that destination services provider, the one who would be their boots on the ground, help you find the properties, um, that they know they could always be a resource as well. Should something come up, if you have an issue with the property, um, yeah, just kind of general questions uh, that yeah, you're certainly have come, you, you <laughs> will have yeah. them. Um, and then also there often they can help uh, refer out to different uh, expat groups too mm -hmm. to start the community. All right. So landing the plane. Yeah. Are we back? Are we in Singapore? Are we back here <laughs> so, in the yeah, States? We're talking about repatriation now. Yep. Okay. So, you know, you've, you've had a successful uh, long-term assignment. It's time to come home. Um, you know, how does the RMC help make sure that the come home trip is a success? But I want you to do it in, this, in, a, in a particular way. I want you to tell me first how it can go wrong. Oh. Okay. And then we'll later tell you how, uh, tell us, you can tell us then how it goes right. Yeah. So ideally, and um, when we know you're coming up on that assignment end date, we start planning six months out, 90 days out, say, are we on track? Are we on track? Are we on track? Because things change. It's like, nope, I think he's doing such a great job. They like it there. Let's extend another 12 months. We've had it. We've started the repatriation process and all of a sudden, they decide to stay longer. The company agrees. So that's first and foremost. We start planning months in advance before you're actually supposed to get in that plane. So once we have that confirmed end date, we're going to start be working towards that saying, what do we need to close out in Singapore? The lease needs to be canceled. The property needs to be turned over. Do the kids need to get out of school? Do we need to get their records? We have to book your trip. So do we work with the travel agency to get that booked? And then did you ship anything, any household good move, household goods? Yeah. So we're going to get that scheduled and then put all that together. So it's so seamless that you pack your household goods, you turn over your property, you get to the airport with your family, and you get on that plane and you have a smooth ride home. Then you get here. I'd like to say everything's back as it was and normal, but it's not going to be mm -hmm. because you were gone for three years. Mm -hmm. um, you might be, you're going to be waiting for some of your things to come back, which can be several weeks, couple months. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're going to be adjusting back. You changed. Uh, people are always changing, but people around you didn't experience what you experienced. Um, and some will be very happy to hear about the experiences. Others, maybe not as much when you come back to work. The same thing will go, you know, hopefully you've been on a bit of a progression plan and your manager has been checking in and looking and saying, okay, what are you learning? What are you going to bring back? Because again, when you come back, we don't want to lose you. We want you to stay and share that knowledge and grow within that. Um, but again, I will say that takes the personal effort too. There's so much that 
those final days when you're getting to repatriate, when you're in that location, it is stressful. It's no different than you when you're moving there, you're coming back. It is a whirlwind. I think people are probably just happy to get on that plane and sit down. I bet. All right. So I have a few other questions for you. Okay. Um, now that we've, you know, handled the the short term, the long term from uh, many points of view. And, um, you know, we have the, you know, we repatriate. And so we're good there. Um, now you have to tell me, you have to answer some questions for me. Okay. So um, if you could serve on a short term assignment anywhere, where would you choose and what would you be doing there? See, Zach, that is such a hard question because there's so many places that I was, I still want to go. Well, would love I to go back it. to it again, but you didn't give me a heads up on this. I know. There's certain questions I would help from you. So. You did. You did. Um, short term assignment. You know, I might choose Singapore. Okay. I have not spent a lot of time in Asia. It is an area that I would certainly love to explore more. Um, so I think for that, I would, I would choose that to learn more about the culture and just how things are done. Cause it is, it's very it's different. Nice. What about a long-term assignment? Where would I want to go for a long-term assignment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. She's like Morocco. <laughs> you know, I, it, but part of South America is intriguing to me. There's some things that are not so intriguing to me about it, but other parts intriguing. Again, I'll put it down to the culture, the warmth of the um, the cultures. It's you know it's the Southern culture, um, which you know, I spent so much time in Europe. There's wonderful places in Europe. I'm like mm, that might be nice, but to learn something new, experiencing something different for a period of time, I am going to pick. I'll pick Brazil. Nice. I'm not going to pick a specific city, but I'll say yeah. Brazil. If I were to go anywhere, like it'd be a much easier ramp because uh, yo sé español. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like that would, you know, I've been to Puebla, Mexico, okay. and that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking like somewhere that's speaking my language, okay. you know, like Chile or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. Yep. All right. Um, so if you could pick any celebrity to be your account executive, who would you pick? Oh, no, he's probably not a good one. <laughs> I had the same experience earlier. I was talking about this with Ben. I was like, Ryan Reynolds. And then I thought about it. I'm like, ah, like I get really confusing. You know, he'd be wonderful. But then eventually I'm like, OK, I'm I need some clear talk here. You know, so I'm going to date. Well, I, I'm the, the person that comes to mind just because we're on a bit of a, a phase in our family of watching shows from the 1970s, things that I maybe didn't necessarily watch. So. Um, two people potentially could see them as great. The, they're, they're men, and um, which we don't always have a lot of men in the account executive roles. Um, did Philip? Philip, you're right. Yeah. We did. Um, but the one that comes to mind, Michael Landon. Okay. Because Michael Landon is always. And if you were uh, going to South Dakota, or you know, he he would be a guy. Like, I know you know, and he knows, or, but he is you know, calm. He is supportive. I can get you guy. He he doesn't, you know, anger easily, you know, he's calm. And I think you just have that very calm presence. And then the other person would be James Garner. Nice. Um, because he's also calm, smiling, tries to connect with individuals. So those those would be my two picks. But again, those I have bad picks. I don't I celebrities I don't follow a lot, uh -huh. but that's just probably recent viewings in our household where I would pick yeah, those. My daughters love. Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. Yep. One of my favorite shows yep. to this day. All right. Um, so a few more. Okay. Bear with me. Okay. Uh, so if you could go on a short-term assignment with anyone, uh, who would it be and why? Um, it would be my family. Oh, you can't say them. That was implicit <laughs> in there. I said my fiance earlier. She was like, no. <laughs> that was excluded. Uh, short -term, if I had to go with somebody? Not my family? Not your family. It's a short-term assignment. Their work, a work colleague, let's say. You, Michelle couldn't travel that long. She couldn't be away. So Michelle and I have traveled internationally a lot. She's super easy to travel with. Okay. Um, it's always great. So I, I could know and trust that. You, you know, you would, it would, it would be fine. You'd get okay. along. So, cause I, I'm trying to minimize the issues that yeah. might be experienced during a short-term assignment. Okay. Because I need to work, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. New dimension, though. Okay. It also has to be a celebrity. 
Oh. <laughs> You're, you're making me think in ways that I just don't think, Zach. That's, so, that's what I'm here for. Oh, well, again, I'm going to someone who might be funny to go with on mm -hmm. an assignment. Telly Savalas. Explain. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm... So watching some Telly Savalas, at least in his role, he just is so straightforward, tells it like it is, just gets out there and, and goes. So I don't know if he's afraid of much, but willing to experience and just go and get things done. Okay. So I think that's having that attitude of just getting out there and doing it. That's that's what I'd go for. So this has been another episode of Relocation Leader. I'm Zach Turbis. We want to thank Molly Vonchich for coming on and talking it up with us. Thank you, Zach. It's yeah. fun, really fun to be here. So we want to encourage you guys to follow us on LinkedIn, where you can stay up to date with everything NEI Global Relocation and Relocation Leader. We also want to encourage you to go over to the neireloc.com all access page because we put white papers, articles that talk a lot about this stuff on there. And we have past symposium videos. If you want to go to those symposium, then make sure that you have September 30th through October 1st locked out. We want to make sure that you can get yourself to Omaha, have a good time with us, and we will cover relocation and all its wonders. And we want to uh, remind everyone that we release episodes every two weeks. So uh, make sure you're checking that. I'm Zach Turbis signing off.